that shifts are periods when change acquires a certain specific gravity and is actually marked in some way. And so you have that well-known idea of cultures going through paradigm shifts. You know, it goes one way, one way, and then a certain sort of tipping point is reached, and then truly things shift. And um, we both feel very strongly that our culture is now deeply, that we are in a period of um, shift um, to which many things are contributing, but I think possibly the largest um, and also most elusive contributing factor is digitization in all of its widespread glory. Um, and when I think about that, what it makes me think is that up until the arrival of digitization, what we had were, we lived by interacting with, as individuals, with various systems, and that's how we carried on our lives. And somehow, in this last period of who knows how many years, but no more than a few decades, those um, discrete systems have morphed. And the feeling, I think, I have, and certainly people I talk to, is that we are now, in fact, living inside of a, a system, and it's a system that is powerful and that we don't really understand its nature in many ways. And it's not always easy to recognize this. We were sitting outside and Dan was saying, but how do you, what are those moments when you feel that you have a place to stand and um, get a glimpse of what's happening? And I, I had one of those fairly recently. I was on my way taking the subway in Boston, it was evening, I was going downtown and I was kind of absorbed and staring at the giveaway newspaper and went into a bit of a trance and I looked up and it was a full car and when I looked up, I saw that absolutely everyone on the car was doing this, you know, just, you know, 80 people were all doing this and I said, you know, there's something new in the world. And I realized, of course, it's not new, it's been going on for a long time, but it just came at me rather overwhelmingly. Um, not that they were looking at that as opposed to looking at that, but that they were looking at something which in fact is um, live and connected. So I was gonna ask a general question just at the outset here. Um, how many of you right now are, have on your person a digital device that allows you to connect to the internet in some fashion. Raise them high, okay. Everybody, pretty much. I see maybe a few exceptions. And my second question, which I hope we will come back to and which will help sponsor this conversation is, how many of you, when you think about that fact, feel that it's profound? Okay, yeah. So. You also feel that it's profound. I think it is too. Um, I got curious fairly recently and did a little Google work uh, to get some historical markers down in order to try to think about this whole question of change, technological change and so on. And these are rough numbers, but I went with the idea that a generation is 25 years, that's kind of an accepted interval. And um, first I looked to see how many generations had elapsed between the earliest uses of language as far as they're able to determine those and the transmission of the spoken word through a wire. And um, my math gave me 8,070 generations. So if you think actually of what a generation is and then do that 8,070 times, and the realization is that up until that moment when people wanted to get to each other, they either had to write it down and send it across space, and that happened only late in the game too, or else they had to call to each other and um, answer back. So 8,070 generations, Edison only, created the phone five generations ago, which again, in this perspective, struck me as remarkable. 
the home use of the telephone, and that means the old rotary machine is two and a half generations old. We're only one generation into the handheld wireless mobile, and even it's only at the very late end of this generation that we are witnessing all of the uh, capabilities that we now have. So when you kind of lay out that historical picture, it's, it's a staggering thing to behold. Um, I'm soon going to stop talking. I wanted to just make one little shimmy before we get on to other things, but um, so thinking about things digital has struck me, and I know because we've been corresponding a little bit that it's a very pressing issue for Dan as well, this question of that these aren't simply add-ons, that these are transformative technologies, and there's a whole deep set of arguments around that. But um, we have, and Dan has a book called The Techno-Human Condition. I think the digital has brought us significantly into something called the techno-human condition, which means both literally I'm about to have a hip replaced, and that's a techno-human condition, but when you look something up on your phone, on Wikipedia, that's also, it's a prosthesis, it's an augmentation, it's part of the package. So there's that level, and then there's the secondary level, which is the sheer fact that we are all connected. We are all nodes, we're all networked. And this is something that has simply not existed until just that little recent increment. Um, which I think is huge and profound, and I think you do as well. And so, last thing, in order to just plant a talking post into the room, I was trying to think, well, what would, this the thing that I want to play against here, if what we're talking about is distribution and lateralness and connectedness and networkedness, and, um, I had an intuition and I called a good friend of mine who's a well-known and very smart Americanist. And I said, what is, what you say is the main text really about self in this country? What's the foundational document? And you know, he has his own biases, but he said without any hesitation, well, it's obviously Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance. And the definition in that essay of what is the human and it's the very basis of the, you know, democratic system, and it's the very basis of one's private, individuated self-realization. It's all that stuff. And that, to me, seems like what is under pressure and what might be morphing uh, in all sorts of fascinating neuropsychological ways. So I'm just going to stop by just two real quick, short quotes from Emerson to give you the flavor of what he thought, but also that has often been regarded as kind of crucial to the uh, picture of the American self or the self in general. He said, there are the voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and the culture of the eater. The virtue in most requests is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. And then he has all sorts of good other things, but nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. And, okay, I'll stop talking now, I've been rattling on, but either, Okay, yeah, well, let me, let me um, try to situate that idea a little more centrally in, in this whole notion of the networked us. Um, uh, I mean, the first thing is to try to set aside the, the danger that, it, you know, sort of any era of technological change is destabilizing, um, uh, makes people question uh, what the sense of the the, the types of progress that going on actually are, what its meaning is for human beings, et cetera. Um, you know, just read Dickens on railroads uh, and, or think about uh, the Gutenberg Press and the Reformation, and it's obvious that there's nothing new about, about 
technologies um, completely remaking society. Um, but I do think there's a different game here afoot. Um, and it's, and what's particularly challenging about it, is something Sven and I were talking about before, is, is how you can actually see it because we're so um, uh, immersed in it. Um, and there, there's two things, it's going on two levels and, and, um, and, and it, it, it's very seductive and de deceptive. And one level, of course, is, is how much gratification there is in all this networkedness, right? I mean, you can find out anything you want to find out instantly. You can com communicate. You can find out how many people like you. <laughs> you, can, you can send tweets out into the universe and see whether or not the world responds. You can get onto YouTube and become famous instantaneously. Um, so there's a huge amount of, of uh, potential for, for some sense of, uh, of I really matter as an individual. I can find the communities of, of people who have the same kind of weird, faddish preferences that I do, and we can create our own virtual communities. Um, uh, artists, I mean, I think in some ways this is a great flourishing for writers. Anyone with, any, with, with anything they, to say can put it out there into the blogosphere, and there's a chance that it will be read. Um, so in some ways this is wonderfully, uh, empowering and, and, uh, and, and creates an opportunity for individual expression and individual um, uh, a, a kind of a stroking by the system that, um, that feels good, right? Um, but then if you ask, but why does the system actually exist? It doesn't exist for us, right? The system exists, um, you know, there, there's a business model, right? Um, so every time you turn on, I mean, it's great that you can locate yourself when you don't know where you're going to go using your cell phone, but you're being located at the same time, right? Um, and it's great that you can get onto Amazon and order the book you want or the pair of athletic socks or whatever it is that you're getting from Amazon, but of course Amazon then knows what. So you're also part of the big database, right? Um, and all that then in a kind of recursive trick um, gets used to focus the network back on making sure that the me, the kind of narcissphere that we all get to create for ourselves, gets reinforced because then Amazon sends us the, the signals for the books that they know we'd most like to read or the music we'd like to hear. Um, so, and NSA, of course, you know, if any of you are thinking bad thoughts, they're going to find out because um, they are reading your email. We now know this and listening to your cell phone. So, so I, my point isn't about paranoia and the, and the system. It's about why this stuff exists and what its purpose is. And what maintains it is us as, as you know, consumer nodes, as self-locating nodes, as communicating nodes that create an information infrastructure that is then used um, to uh, do things like sell us crap, uh, make sure we're safe, um, and make sure uh, we know where everyone is at every moment. Um, for whatever uh, good that happens to accomplish. So, so and, and not only that, the functionality emerges from the complete abnegation of identity, right? So those databases, they're not valuable because, of, because you're an individual. They're valuable because you're one of 300 American individuals, all of whom accumulate into a database from which information can be derived. So two things are going on, one, this, this um, the sense of I'm really important because here's all this information I can, I can get at and get to um, and here's all this feedback that can tell me how cool my ideas are or how cool other people think my ideas are. Um, but then there's the sense of, of kind of radical dehumanizing um, uh, kind of you're, you're just a node in this complex network um, that has its own kind of purpose. And I think this is a, is a huge challenge to any and when I say Emersonian notion, I will say, sheepishly, my, my first encounter with Emerson was two weeks ago when Sven mentioned self-reliance. But um, uh, I've always found him dauntingly um, uh, turgid. But I, he is that. But, but, um, but it's a really powerful, wonderful, um, wonderful piece. And so the, to me, the question that it raises is, is, in a world where all our needs are met by the network, right? Um, there's no getting lost anymore. 
There's no not having the information that you need. There's no, there's no lack of support for any opinion you have, however ill-founded and, and irrational, right? There's always, because there's other people. Who, so you get everything you need. So how is it even possible to step back um, and do what Emerson uh, insists that we do, which is, is assert some sense of individuality kind of against the grain, um, uh, some kind of absolutely determined um, kind of non-conformity, not for its own sake, uh, but to honor the kind of um, the, the, the uniqueness of your own um, of your own sensibility, your own subjective sensibility. It seems like the possibility of doing that um, is is threatened, and I think that's uh, that's something to really worry about. I think it's significant in a way that we're having the conversation under the auspices of Bennington College, in particular, because it is sort of uh, specifically pledged, I think, to those qualities more than many other places, or it foregrounds them more, that notion of uh, you know, unique self-expressiveness and so on. There's a, a piece I wanted to throw into this, um, which in part, there's that whole question of the um, inclusiveness of this and the fact that it's seductive and that we all love it. I mean, I love it too, you know, we're just, in it and um, sometimes against our own so-called better judgment, we uh, keep our participation going and get woven in a little more fully into this net. Um, there's one thing which is the question of just private volition and saying, well, I'm just not gonna do this. I'm gonna just be my own person <laughs> and whatever. But I think there's that, um, this happens to be coincidentally or not, also kind of the period in our culture of the sciences, obviously, where the rising and reigning new paradigm seems to be that of neuroscience, you know, and the underlying tenet here is in part that uh, we are neurally extraordinarily plastic and that our behaviors and what we do rather quickly, more quickly than one had ever thought, change us. They physically alter um, you know, our circuitries and how we then go forth to encounter the world. So if we are in fact living much, much differently than we lived even a quarter century ago, and I do think we are, I don't think a quarter century ago most people spent most of the day sitting in front of an illuminated screen. Now we often do. Um, if you start to think, well, this also might in fact not just be an elective affinity that we found, but something that has uh, other effects that might change the way we operate in the world. Um, that's also worth considering. I have no answers there, but I know that a big book two years ago, which interested me, because it's the topic that concerns me, was called The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. And the title was very significant because the suggestion short version is that what we've given up and what we are giving up through these interactions is the basic paradigm of depth. That uh, we are letting depth go in exchange for a kind of interconnectedness and lateral reach that our instruments now make extremely possible and encourage. And of course, we all experience this, every, right? Every one of us, right? I mean, who, who another show of hands. Who feels like their attention span is as good as it was 10 or 15 years ago? Then you, you, you people are, we need, to, we need a tutorial from you guys, okay? <laughs> um, my, my own experience um, is, is of completely f uh, a shattered um, capacity for attention because of the, the continual, both the assault of information, but also the seductiveness of, of the availability of information. Um, and so, uh, you know, is that a threat to the, the, the notion of the importance of depth? Of depth? Um, uh, it's, it, for, for one thing, just the simple question of how one creates a space away from the, the noise, um, the, the, the flow of information so that one can engage in the reflection and the, the deep thinking that's necessary to get your head around some problems 
is, you know, is that going away? I mean, I think that's a question where we, we would yeah. like to talk about more. to hear what and people think about the daily living aspects as well as the others, but just how do we, um, do you feel it as something that every now and then you'll stop and say, gee, I really have to, you know, start limiting my intake or start changing? Um, do you feel it as dangerous? If so, why? I mean, what is it that is being put in danger? And then what things do we try to do and how effective are they? Do we, if we found the kind of balance we're hoping for, you know, in our own sort of daily lives. And, and I think this, this question of, of um, I mean, I'd also be very interested to hear people's sense of this quest, this whole issue of individuality. I mean, we're in a culture that reveres individuality and the notion of the individual and individual agency is, is um, you know, central to the whole idea of what it is to be modern, modern enlightenment, rational person. But, but it's also, you know, um, where does the individual reside now? Where is the capacity to express oneself authentically to use it overused, but I think maybe the appropriate word in this context, um, to express oneself individually given the interconnectedness of everything um, and the, the lack of reflective uh, um, space. Do these, do these issues trouble anyone or is, it, or is this just the, 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 just the musings of two, you know, two lost souls here? Um, uh, yeah, please, whoever would like to start. Yeah, so, so here's, I mean, I think, here, here's the question that torments me. I don't know whether it doesn't, doesn't mean it needs to bother anyone else. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it's true that 100 years from now we'll look back on this and see this conversation as quaint. Um, but, but that doesn't mean, well, we won't look back on it, but were we to look back on it? Um, but that doesn't, I mean, things are being lost as new things are created. And, um, uh, I think it's the, is it possible to ask what's being lost that we would be better off not losing? Um, or must we simply be swept up on the, the tide of change and say this is, you know, this is the, our fate as, as innovating humans. Um, we're continually uh, reforming the landscape on which we stand and, and we should just shut up and, and, and go with it. Um, I, but I think it's more than philosophical because there's winners and losers and um, we have institutions that have developed around old ways of doing things. Uh, do those institutions still make sense? Um, if they don't, what's going to replace them? And, uh, you know, things like wars get fought over such types of questions. Um, you know, if you think about the origins of the Luddites, which now is a term for making fun of people who don't accept technological change, a lot of it's for people who were losing their jobs because power looms were replacing home looms and ways of life were being destroyed. So now we can just look at it as a historical artifact and those were, you know, those were the losers and that's the way it was. Um, but, but uh, you know, how in the time of the shift can one try to have some clarity about what's worth um, not giving up on and what would that mean? So. Yeah, I just wanted to also say, <clears throat> What's you, your point about the shifting in uh, modes of communication between, say, oral and writing, which I think was an enormous watershed. Um, it was one that you can still speak of as somehow being within the realm of communication. I think the shift we're talking about involves communication, but it really is all embracing in a way that it includes marketing, surveillance, it includes so many things. It's not easy to break it down anymore because the digital is such a universal. You know, it also includes the whole kind of question of subjectivity versus objectivity because mm -hmm. ne what neuroscience seeks to do is, is to make objective the subjective, the experience of, of the individual. So, so once you can reduce it all to a set of, of neurochemical um, reactions, you know, does that tell us anything? I mean, in my view, it doesn't tell us anything, but it still creates an incredible capacity to actually do things yes. and to change, one's, uh, to change one's view about the meaning of subjectivity and self-consciousness. So there's, I think, also really 
profound philosophical questions that are getting raised through the advance of science that in the past were simply abstract. Right. You know. A couple of hands, a bunch of hands. Why don't we go one, two, three and see what we pull up. You, you first. Would you say, speaking as a 20, 20 something, that yours, and if you could speak for your sense of your peers, would you say that your use of these media is ironic or sincere or to neither word? You had that little moment right in the beginning where you said, Facebook? Kind of, it acknowledged something. As so, so you're saying that there is, there, that, that, um, there is still, there, there's not a complete capitulation to a, a new way of thinking about one's, uh, yeah, but, but there's a little Velcro. I think you have, you're absolutely right that there's no, anything that we're going to find that is a loss is going to have a whole group of pluses around it as well. Just You were talking, I was thinking, I just got a book in the mail, haven't even really looked at it, but it's by the critic Phyllis Rose, and she basically found herself in a library and decided, wondered what would happen if she just took ten books from a shelf and made those her mission to read them, books that one would probably never read anymore, just to take down, you know, whatever, history of the Merrimack Rivers, I don't know, but just to read them seriously and occupy herself thus, almost as this weird compensation for what you're talking about. And then I just had that quick image of, um, it was only recently that we still had the uh, card catalog, and Nicholson Baker had an essay in the New Yorker, which <clears throat> kind of showed, it was a wonderful image that if you use the card catalog enough, you learn to read the smudges you learn to see where they got darker and where people were going to more, but you could see the other locales kind of to shroud an area. So it wasn't just the one, but you could sort of see a little map of... Uh, he, he also had a, a I, don't, I don't think it was the same essay, where, where he looked at, at catalogs where they had bookshelves in the background and looked at what the books were and then went and read them and wrote about them. Mm. And so maybe what we really need to say is we all need to be like Nicholson Baker and figure <laughs> out how he, how he manages to find the time to do that. But, but, but which makes me want to ask, so some, of, some people held up their hands and said, no, we don't have any problem with attention span. I'd like to be, I mean, part of the problem with, with pursuing depth isn't that it's not there. You could find it all on the web, right? Um, uh, in fact, more than in the library, it's just that you're continually seduced away from it. So, so those who don't feel like that's a problem, how do you manage that? <laughs> the fact that they're also so interlinked is interesting in its comment on human nature because a lot of writers now install things that will allow them to write and keep them from doing what you would think one's own self-control would be able to accomplish, but say, I'm just not gonna go, but they actually force it you know, they cannot go to the internet while they're typing, you know. They can. There was a question over there that we didn't get to. Yeah, I think it was yours. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I can tell you that I have little exercises that I go through, but they're, they're somewhat, I don't know, quixotic or... Oh, tell or, us or, one. <laughs> or, but, um, I mean, first, just to, to, to just make this, I hope, more than simple self-indulgence, um, you know, I, I think if one thinks about the relationship between oneself as, as you know, you get all the gratification that you need through, through your interaction with the network versus um, uh, the network itself and how it uses you, I think it's important to remember that it uses us in all sorts of ways, including political manipulation, right? So now nothing is done um, on the political scene, at least at the national level, uh, without a high, high degree of predictivity on what it's going to do in the voting realm, and that's because all of that stuff is now understood and digitized. And so, do you want to inter intervene on this particular point? Or, okay, so, so, um, so uh, I, I, I guess I, I see, um, and also, you know, as one of us, right, so we're all 
whatever it is we are that makes us be in this room now, um, we obviously share some, I assume, some uh, um, commitment to the notion that deep reflection, um, uh, critical engagement of hard problems is, is worthwhile in its own right, but also an important part of how humans um, navigate the world. So, so, you know, I do things like I won't use um, uh, Google Maps when I'm lost uh, because, and, and maybe, you know, this is the equivalent of males refusing to ask directions, I suppose, right? <laughs> uh, but but um, I enjoy figuring it out, right? Um, but maybe more seriously, um, and, 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 and I don't know that there's a principle here, um, but I think because it's so easy to get validation for anything you think on the internet, I think it creates a particular obligation for anyone who wants to say they're a critical thinker to really try to understand the origins of their own beliefs about things. Um, uh, and I think, you know, I find when I try to look in inwardly about why I think what I think, um, in, in most cases, uh, there's not a particularly satisfactory answer. Um, there is some combination of culture and influences and what I read in the paper the day before and the fact that I'm a certain type of person, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, you know, I think the, the, the Emersonian obligation is, is given all this capacity to, to, to make yourself feel smart and popular, um, how do you do the opposite and make yourself, you know, feel like a loser who's wrong about everything? Um, <laughs> And, and that, you know, that kind of creates a, 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 a kind of a critical edge and a critical tension that maybe forces you into the stance of, um, of, of self-reliance because you don't assume that just because the feedback you're getting from the world, and this is something Emerson's yeah. explicit about, you know. Yeah. It's like, don't believe what people tell you. Flattery is the, basically the most dangerous intellectual habit to get into. So. So I think, um, I, I just think that, the, that the, the, the network challenge is to be more ruthless and relentless in, in one's um, self-critical ex exercises, but it's hard, you know, it's hard to do. And, and I don't mean to say this in any kind of self-righteous way, I'm not saying I do it well. Um, but I think, I think the danger is that we get away from that, and oh. that breeds ideology that's un, unreflective. I wanted to bounce off of that. I was thinking here too that one of the things that <clears throat> we had talked about as a possible topic of interest and nothing we can obviously get into very deeply, but I noticed that some members of the Bennington community or the administrative community are sitting in front. And one of the questions we had as we were talking was, we're talking to a bunch of people in a Bennington context. Do we raise the question of if this is interesting, problematic, challenging, uh, do places like Bennington or, you know, colleges, universities actually have a role now in raising it, teaching it. Um, I just wonder, any sense from how this plays through the life of the college and whether it's all these questions that are raised, whether Does it raise obligations, different yeah. obligations for us as kind of part of a special community? Yeah. Um, to I think we agree. Yeah, and it carries over certainly into any discipline where students are supposed to absorb, uh, contemplate, and then sort of. It's, but I think it's really difficult. Yeah. It's really difficult. Um, and and maybe whether you can do it on the internet or not is immaterial. The fact is, is there's so many distractions from it um, and reasons not to, and ways to quickly find what you need to answer the question. Like you say, you get your 50 or 500 pictures on Google Images. It's really hard to um, know what to do. I mean, I can tell you that one of the, the I, I try as quickly as I can in every, in all the courses I teach now, simply to, to rub my students' noses in really deep contradictions that make them feel really uncomfortable. Um, uh, just because that, I think, at least kind of triggers the notion that um, what they know isn't enough. It doesn't necessarily make them dig in more deeply, but um, it, it creates a, a stimulus to mm -hmm. inquiry. So, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, 
So one question, again, it would be interesting to see the sense of the group is, is um, you know, is this just a really uncomfortable moment that we have to get over, or is there some obligation to actually find a way to, to you know, or if we don't do anything, to work. Put, put a spanner <laughs> in the works? Or... Yeah, I'm just saying, like, you that. Yeah, so, so let, me, um, let, let me be a little more uh, tendentious then and say, um, uh, and make a more assertive case on behalf of, of why it's important to think about the not only what's good, but what are we losing, which is, is we're not in charge of the evolution of the system, right? No one is in charge of the evolution of the system. It is an emergent outgrowth of all of our behaviors. And so um, the question of agency, I think, and of what it, what it, what's incumbent upon the individual to actually do um, and how, they, how we ought to think about this, I think actually is a real challenge to the whole notion of us as individuals in democratic societies with allegedly some control over our, um, o o over our decisions and governance and institutions. Now, I'm not saying this was necessarily ever much better, um, but, but now there is this illusion that we all do have a certain kind of agency because of the positive feedbacks from the system. Um, and I wonder if that uh, um, it, it anesthetizes us a little bit. So, so I actually want to make a more assertive case that the reason that, that, that it's not just a balance between what we're losing and what we're gaining and get over it, but, but, but that um, uh, the logic of the networks is not a logic that is an additive of what we want. It is a logic that is imminent in the network itself. Um, and that, that may or may not be consistent with the world that we are trying to achieve. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think, that's, I think the, the internet destabilizes expertise in ways that's very good. I wouldn't d deny that at all. I think that's, that's absolutely right. So, um, someone who hasn't yes. said anything yet? And this is something we were talking about just before we came in here, which is another thing books are, just implicitly books in libraries, is they're active um, reminders of history and therefore of knowledge as a contextual matter. And the biggest drawback possibly of absolutely distributed knowledge networks is the complete loss of context, you know. And we do tend to forget about history, and we tend to think that anything that happened before a certain very recent date is kind of laughably out of date because it's pre this or pre that. But you know, we know that's not really true, and you almost need the physical evidence of books to sometimes substantiate that for you, just to realize they, they amass, and they go back and back, and they really are a kind of accumulation of a culture's enterprise. Yes? Yeah, um, this, is the, this is for the next hour. Okay. Yes. <laughs> for those of you who are brave but, enough to sit around. Um, yeah, I do have one thought on that, which is um, it's part of an argument I've been following, which is sort of has to do with the notion of the de death of the expert, but it's it goes hand in hand with the notion of um, knowledge increasingly being kind of a consensual business. And Wikipedia is a kind of early formation of that, that it's just not ascribed to a particular authority. It has become a mass you know, data accumulation. And that, that is, so expertise does seem to go out the window. It really becomes a matter of um, the quality of searchability of what you want to know because there's just this vast data pool possible now, but you have to know where in it to go. So maybe the new kind of expert is not the person who knows the thing, but the person who knows navigation. <laughs> well, sense. but I also think there's, there, this gets beyond our conversation, but, but there is, the relationship of expertise in society is radically different because the relationship of science and technology and society are so different. You know, think about something like the, the, 
debate over mammograms, all right, where you get to s s see experts telling each other how completely they wrong they are with religious fervor um, on a subject that we used to think was something we could just turn over to doctors to tell us what the answer is. Um, so I think, I, I mean, I think that it would be great if we could know who the experts are. I think on most issues, that is an, is, is a, um, uh, an, an ideal that's going to get harder and harder to, to maintain and um, uh, that there's nothing we can do about that. And there is, there, there is loss and there is gain there. But um, it's science and technology are victims of their own success in this regard. And the complexification of the world that they have led to um, increasingly means that, that, that expertise Expertise worthy of the name as it used to be meant is narrower and narrower and therefore less applicable to the big sorts of issues that, that generally make it out into the, into the world. So we have a, cu a couple more minutes. Um, whoever, people who haven't talked. Isabel. Yep. So what is the place of appeal that we go to? If we have those, if I'm a student and I'm really just, you know, inundated with data and my professor is likewise somewhat inundated with data and it's like where does the info buck stop <clears throat> in terms of this kind of navigation so I guess it's a question of authority which used to be pretty hierarchical and wrongly or rightly there was you know you'd keep going higher up until you got to the the know-it-all who'd say well this is it <laughs> Yeah, we, we, this is something that is going to be lost, yeah. and, and mm. there's, there's good and bad to that. There's been a patient hand over there, mm. so patient unacknowledged hand. Or I'm being liked. So there's this question of... Right. I think that's what we're asking. Yeah. We like you. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> For what it's worth. Nothing. We're, we're, we're quickly running out of time. Yeah. Any, any other uh, questions, comments? Although I think you're saying something different, right? Yeah. You're saying, saying that, that he, here we are, you know, saying, oh my God, what's happening? And, and in, your, the, the, in, in your relatives' villages, nothing's happening. They're just on to the next thing, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. This whole conversation yep. is, is, uh, such a, it's, it's I was sure. curious whether you, your reaction on being there was to feel this as a kind of lifting or empowering emotion, or was it, were you anxious and kind of weren't sure why? What was your gut? That's interesting. But maybe also there's no um, illusion of control, which is very much a part of what the Enlightenment is all about. Right? Yeah, when you're, when you're, it's not about No, I think that's a really fascinating, also the, so the individual is different, the notion of control is different, the notion of, exp yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Should we make this the last hand and then we'll, That's such a good word to end on, the word potential. We should lock that in. Thank you, everybody, for coming to hear a couple of old gaffers.